Hi, I'm David Sproxton. I'm co-founder of Ardman Animations, a, a company that's been running for just over 40 years now. I guess we proud ourselves on you know, character-led stories. That's at the heart of what we do. You know, the format, the technology, whether that's stop frame or CG or indeed VR, we, we're at the heart of all that stuff is, is story. And at the heart of story is some emotional, compelling thing that will capture the public's imagination. And generally, that's around character. Shaun the Sheep's a great example. Actually, fundamentally, it's, a, it's about a family, a family set on a farm, a farmer, a, an older brother, Shaun, and his siblings, the flock. So they are, in a way, typically family tile problems, but set in um, a, a bunch of animals. But we, we come at it from a very, very story-based point of view. So we've been doing a bit of VR work recently. Uh, we've been invited to join the BAFTA LA VR advisory group, which has been really interesting. But our take on that, we're not going to be leading-edge technologists. That's not what we do. What we're looking at VR from our point of view is how do you tell stories? What's the different format? What, how do you need to structure your stories in a, a perhaps different way to be compelling and engaging for an audience? But that's very much at the heart of what we do. I mean, as you know, it was, it was a hobby which, which, which built into a bit of a business. You know, we, Pete and I met at school. We were playing around with the old 16mm clockwork Bolex. We got a break on children's television with, uh, out, of, out of which came our dear little character, Morph. And we spent a few years making a Morph series and doing quite a lot of sequences with Morph. And then that grew into, actually, Channel 4 came online and we were commissioned to do some work for them. So we did five short films originally. Um, and then five more, one of which, of course, became was Creature Comforts. And those led to, you know, advertising films, uh, a lot of advertising work, at which point you started to make a bit of money, which we reinvested. So it was a kind of organic growth. I don't think we had a sort of, right, day one, we got a great strategy for conquering the animation industry. That wasn't our ground plan at all. It was just taking it step by step. As opportunities arose, um, you know, it was a very, very different world in the 1970s and 1980s. Getting into television was difficult. There weren't many opportunities for, for you know, young emerging talent and certainly young emerging animators. Uh, our aspiration at the time was the, the five-minute animated slot, which happened be between the end of children's television on BBC and the six o'clock news. And that's where Paddington Bear appeared, that's where the Wombles appeared, the Herbs. And that's what we, and that's what we did a, a morph series for. We did a five-minute morph series, for, particularly for that slot. Um, alongside the, the insert work we were doing for Take Heart. So we just did it step by step. There was never, never great, no great ground plan. And I think that's probably allowed us to be quite flexible. Opportunities have arisen. We've taken those. We've moved forward, brought in more people to help tackle the opportunities that arose. And I'll often, I've often stated this, the impact of Channel 4 on the UK animation industry was absolutely massive. It didn't cost them a lot of money, but the impact was huge, and it helped build and certainly made visible the talent that was in the UK. And it's a bit of a shame now that actually Channel 4 don't do that, and there's nobody really commissioning those rather more sophisticated short animation films, which Channel 4 did. But that, they gave us, or that, that opportunity allowed us to really step up to the ladder. And of course, by that time, we'd met Nick Park, and we said, look, we've got another five films to do for Channel 4. Nick, do you want to do one? And he said, yes, I want to do one around a zoo. Um, and, uh, you know, it was an Oscar-winning film, which is fantastic. So it's been a, an, basically an organic, steady, step-by-step -step growth. That's a really interesting question about how you thrive and survive in, in these very, very different, quite volatile circumstances. You know, we've got these new players, we've got Netflix, we've got Amazon, we've got Google, all of whom, and Facebook even, and, of course, YouTube, all basically trying to work out what areas of, of, of this world they can enter and where they put their money. Um, I don't, there's no easy answer to that, and I think that's why we have a kind of a multiplex of activity because we're kind of trying to, trying to work out which way things are going. And we have, from that point of view, have in a way multiple income streams. The commercial advertising business, that's changing quite a lot. You know, money's got tighter on that, and I think the ad industry is looking at how it reaches eyeballs when they're not necessarily on television, they're on laptops, they're online. Uh, that's in a bit of a free fall at the moment. You mentioned the feature film industry. How many feature, animated feature films came out last year? It was like over 120, I think somebody told me. So finding, getting screen time and visibility, and of course the big studios, those films are big risks. They are you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and a lot of P&A spend. Um, and if they don't hit a target, it's a lot of money down the pan. And as a smaller independent animated feature film sort of producer, 
I think we've realised our markets are probably you know, the more European sensibility, and, and Asia is a, is a big market for us. Japan, China's opening up. So America is less important for us. It used to be quite important. It's less important to us as we distribute our work elsewhere. But we've had to cut our cloth uh, and bring our budgets down and find ways of telling stories which are have scale and sort of visual impact, but actually cost less to, to, re to reduce the risks, knowing broadly what our films will do in the marketplace. It's a kind of, it's kind of a re reversed engineered equation. You kind of say, well, what's the box office expectation for this film? It's going to be about X. Ergo, the budget needs to be X minus or whatever it is. So we're kind of coming at it from that point of view. Mainly, and, you know, now we're being funded for feature films by Studio Canal, which is great. Uh, very much a European base to their, their, their worldview, which I think is wonderful. Um, we're trying to de-risk you know, the finances. They're relatively new in the game, particularly in the family animated film kind of space. Um, so we're working kind of together on how, to how to get our films out there. But I think... Yes, we've had to adjust. You know, the DreamWorks experience was fantastic. Ten years, three movies with DreamWorks, learned an awful lot, pretty big budget stuff. Uh, from our point of view, and in terms of British films in the US, they all played quite well. In terms of DreamWorks' aspirations of what they wanted an animated feature to do, they were a little bit further down the, the league table. But actually, from our point of view, they played pretty well, and they, they were very, very supportive. Sony was a bit the same, again, very, very supportive. Uh, and as you say, the big studios need to have big successes, uh, and their business plans and their shareholders expect you know, big profits and big dividends. And relatively, we are a small player in that market. Um, so, as you say, you know, studios have gone up, studios have gone down, they all change. DreamWorks is now something completely different to what it was three or four years ago. Um, totally different beast, and we'll see where that goes. Um, Sony, similarly, you know, that's changed. So there's a lot of musical chairs uh, being moved around in the Hollywood studios in our, our sector. So how have we, well, we thought, well, how do we kind of have a more stable setup, um, which in a way is a more European approach to it. But there's no guarantee that any of these will really make you a lot of money, I think. Um, you know, we're talking to YouTube. We've done stuff on YouTube. We run a number of YouTube channels. Uh, the Morph one is the one that most people probably might know about. Is that breaking even? Not yet. No, it's getting there. It'll be another year, maybe, until we start to get, you know, you get to kind of like a million viewers and things then start to take off. And it's building that, that momentum and that audience base. It takes a bit of time. And I think uh, we've always had a long view of this. We've always known that it takes quite a while in the animation industry to recoup your investment, even on a, a TV series. You know, Sean the Sheep, we always knew every time we, we did another, another series of episodes, it would take three or four years to recoup that. So we always had this long-term plan um, on, on that sort of work and not expecting the money to come rolling in on, on sort of day two. It doesn't work like that. And the features are the same, actually. They have a long tail, you know, so they go out theatrically, go onto television, or go onto downloads. There's a long tail, and eventually you might, you might kind of get your money back or you might make a bit of money on an ongoing basis. Um, I don't, I don't think there's an easy answer at the moment at all. Um, cost base is one thing. But I say, the most important thing, can you put out stories that people want to watch? I mean, a lovely film like My Life is a Courgette costs, what, $8, $8 million? Very, very low budget, incredibly moving. I've seen it three times now. I cry every time. Um, you know, it's quite an adult movie. It looks very simple and quite naive in many ways, but it's an incredibly moving story. And that's at the heart of it, isn't it? If you can tell a good story, you'll find an audience, and that audience, hopefully, will be willing to pay something to, to, to go and see it. I think one of the things, going back to the Channel 4 um, subject, what they did was open up animation for more of an adult audience. And adults kind of said, oh, actually, I thought animation was for kids, but it isn't. There are all these other stories that could be told, subjects that could be tackled. And I would opine that The Simpsons came out of that move by Channel 4 to put animation into, you know, the, you know, the uh, mainstream, more adult television. Um, you know, the first one they did was in the Tracy Ullman show. That was a risk. Adult comedy show, let's put a bit of animation in there and out of that span. So, I, um, you know, The Simpsons. And I think the more of these features are done, the more the audience, particularly the more adult audience, becomes aware, actually, these are really interesting films to watch. Now... Europe, you have uh, a lot of tax breaks and subsidies, and also you have more 
um, a bit of a quota system in terms of what's being shown at cinema screens. Uh, in, the, in the UK, we don't. We're overwhelmed by mostly American product in our multiplexes, which are mostly American-owned, I hasten to say. Um, and there are obviously art house cinemas in the UK as well. But the UK in particular is one of the worst territories in Europe to see European films, simply because of uh, what is effect, almost a monopoly situation with distribution and, and exhibition in particular. In Europe, that's less so. You've got more... Um, more well, nationally owned or rather private cinemas, you tend to have a promise that you will show European films alongside the American product. So there's, there's an avenue for distribution there. And of course, that opens up the audience to a different, a, a different sort of filmmaking. And you know, we see it in Annecy every year, don't we? A lot of European feature films, a lot of European short films. Um, a lot of those rarely get to the UK, and a lot of them certainly won't get to the US. Um, but I think, you know, with the digital platforms, which are more international, you can reach them pretty well from wherever you are in the world. I think as those, anyway, those communities which can communicate on social media about stuff that's coming out, I think will have a different, a different way of reaching our audiences. They may be at home, they may be on laptops, they may be on, you know, 60-inch flat screens in their sitting rooms. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of hopeful that... Uh, in a way, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, when uh, digital printing came in, there was a huge cry from the union saying, oh, my God, this is the end of life as we know it. You now go into a newsagent, a magazine shop, and there are literally hundreds of titles uh, dealing with quite small specialist sectors of the public, you know, whether it's fishing or model railways or aircraft or beauty or fashion. There are more magazines being printed now than ever before in the history of mankind each one for a niche market. And I think we're getting to that situation where you can publish the stuff, films, and you can put them onto a platform and your audiences will, will find them. The big trick is how do you make them visible and how do, you, how do you say, hey, we're over here, come watch our site. And it's something that we're very aware of. And we, we are Aardman, we're quite aware of, of a, a sort of responsibility in a way to help emerging talent to expose their work. So we are, you know, some of the YouTube channels we're looking at running are about actually other, other people's work, some funky stuff, a little bit like uh, Angry Kid with Darren Walsh. You know, he worked with us for a long time, came up with Angry Kid. Actually, it is one of the very first things we put out online with um, Atom Films way, way back. But that was an opportunity, hey, come take a look at this guy's work. It's great, it's great fun, it's very different, but we, 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 we're enjoying it, we hope you'll enjoy it. So it's kind of... Um, kind of curating uh, material, isn't it? And it's a bit like the way the broadcasters work, whether it's the BBC or whether it's CBS or ABC. They have a brand around their programmes, and as an audience member, you say, ah, the BBC, this will be good stuff. You know, you don't know exactly what they're going to throw at you, but you know their brand says quality.